podcast i'm with your co-host charles skaggs back in ghostwood forest once again ready to talk more david lynch films with my wonderful co-host wonderful friend and someone who is i just talked to yesterday on next stop everywhere zan sprouse how you doing zan i'm doing good charles yeah we can we can pretty much talk about anything here. yeah but that's one of the things i like about us that's yeah. We are, you know, our we, we have very diverse tastes. You're very like eclectic. Yeah, exactly. Our nerdy connections know no boundaries, and so much so that I still learn like a ton from you because your interests. You know, you have we have similar interests, but we each have our own individual interests. Mm-hmm. So I feel like, like, I, I, like I'm learning something new. I feel like I'm getting something brand new from this this interaction that we have yeah that's the thing it's like each especially when we're just talking about random stuff and Mm -hmm. something will pop into your head and i'll be like oh what's that yeah that's the thing i mean nerdy nerdy facts are nerdy facts and you know we exchange them and yours are interesting i'm glad you find mine interesting so i always find yours interesting we do we do well with that although i don't sometimes i don't feel like i hold up the interesting end of the bargain but i try my best no, I think you're very interesting. Yeah. I've got you fooled. All right. Good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, everybody here at episode 91, getting up there, we're going to be talking oh, wow. wild at heart and weird on top. La, la. Yeah. So this is the 1990 romantic crime film written and directed by David Lynch, produced by Steve Golan. Monty Montgomery, yeah, that guy, you know, the cowboy, and I hope I'm pronouncing this right, Sigurjan Sigvatsen, who must be so. must be one of the Norwegians. The Norwegians are leaving. Leaving. Norwegians <laughs> are leaving. This is based on the 1989 novel Wild at Heart, the story of Sailor and Lula by Barry Gifford. So, like, wait a minute, the book came out in 89, but the movie came out in 1990. And that's one of the things I want to talk about when we get to trivia. Yeah, we need to talk about that. We do. We do. So this is something, uh, you know, Zan had mentioned that we should talk about since we talked about Dune last time. Any reason why you wanted to talk about this one next? We we, we talk a lot about Dune and the grandioseness of it, how it's not David Lynch's usual thing. We talk a lot for the same reason about the elephant man, we talk a lot about blue velvet because we say it's the sort of proto twin peaks. Okay. But we don't talk that much about wild at heart, even though, and and I think we should, because this is a movie that came out the same time twin peaks was on. Mm -hmm. And it has a lot of twin peaks, bit players and major players, which we'll run down here in a second. It has that David Lynch feel of there, people are, there's always more to people than what they seem and not all of it's very good. Right. And well, there's a lot of that in this one. Yeah. Yeah. And it has Laura Dern, who should be in every David Lynch movie, if you ask me. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. And other people who I think are great for David Lynch, but we don't see much of them in David Lynch things. Um, People like Willem Dafoe. Right. And um, Diane Ladd. Diane Ladd. Why isn't Crispin Glover in more David Lynch movies? You would think, right? <laughs> you would I think. think. Have, I think David Lynch and Crispin Glover have a quirkiness that butt heads a little uh, sometimes. That the quirkiness doesn't always gel with each other. But Like, I think the, like they're both artists. 
and David Lynch's yeah. sensibilities don't quite mesh with Glover's, is what you're saying. Right. And I, I feel like, especially after seeing, after seeing this movie, mm -hmm. um, Crispin Glover would have made a fantastic Johnny Horn. Yes, he would have. I agree with that. Just that sort of, that sort of possibly mentally disabled man child type character. Yeah. He would have made a great Johnny Horn. And since we already had like three Johnny Horns, why can't Chris just be one that. of them? I was just yeah. thinking, it was like, we've had three. Why not have a go for a fourth, you know? And, and, uh, yeah. hey, do another Twin Peaks season, season four, right? Yeah. Yeah. With, with Chris Glover as Johnny Horn. Yeah. As Johnny Horn. Heck yes. There you go. For sure. Yeah, let's make that um, happen. But I, I feel like this movie, this might be, and it's hard, you know, picking David Lynch movies is a, is a difficult one, but this is, I love this movie. Um, I love, it's problematic, but I think Sailor and Lula have a, an adorable love story. Right. Um, you know, I love all of these disgusting people all for the same, all trying to do the same thing. Um, I love all the people that pop up in this movie. I think one of the most tragic scenes on one of the most tragic death scenes on film is Sherilyn Fenn. Not, yeah. Sherilyn Fenn's yes. death. Movie. Right. So, so wonderfully tragic. She's um, dying she right in front of a sailor. And you're just, you cry. You can't not cry watching, watching that one. And, um, I think that there's just this movie, it's very white trash, but it's very David Lynch. I feel yeah. like the people in this movie aren't our usual fare. It's like if he made a movie about all the people that know Frank Booth. <laughs> yes. It would be wild. So, so like Frank Booth's side <laughs> of the family, essentially. Frank Booth's side of the story is, is this one. Yeah. I think that's a great so. summation. Because, Thank you. Because as we know, when we talk Blue Velvet, Frank Booth is one of the most unpleasant characters because of just yeah, he's horrible. being such a like a horrible sociopath mm -hmm. and psychopath that naturally, you know, and, and it seems like all the people that he knows are just equally horrible. Yeah. So yeah. it would make perfect sense that so many of these horrible people in this movie would be right there with him. You know, that they yeah. they would have to be related somehow. And and considering, you know, some of these some of these uh, Southern sensibilities, shall we say, that there's a strong possibility they could be related to each other. And, and I, I feel like if anybody can give Frank Booth a run for his money as about being a horrible, horrible, horrible character that you can't stop watching, it, it's Bobby Peru. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I would say uh, if of all the characters, Bobby Peru is probably the closest to Frank Booth. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He's disgusting. Yep. But to bring Frank excuse me, Frank Booth's credit, at least he didn't blow his face off with a shotgun. That's true. Yeah. He still, he still essentially has a head. Yes. So. Technically. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I think this movie, it, Sailor and Lula are like a total white trash Bonnie and Clyde. Right. But they, but they love each other. And I think this, this is an extremely romantic ending. I love the ending of this movie. The ending is it's, fantastic. I will give you that. It's is so it? sweet. Yeah. One thing that's one of the things I want to talk about in trivia because apparently David Lynch didn't like Barry Gifford's ending in the book. So okay. he's like, screw that. I'm going to do my own ending. And what he came up with, I think it works brilliantly. It's probably one of his, because for one thing, for David Lynch, it's an actual ending, which we rarely get in David Lynch films. It's an actual, it's a, and it's you know a proper it ending. It's a hopeful ending. Right. Which is another thing we don't always maybe, see. Maybe that's why we don't talk about this movie much, because it's at the end it's hopeful. Well, I mean I would say I would say it's tainted, but the end of Blue Velvet is a little bit hopeful too. This is true. You know, Dor Dorothy Valens gets her kid back mm -hmm. and you know, it I'm not quite sure what's gonna happen with Jeffrey. Does he ever get to go back to college? I don't know, but Dorothy Valens gets her kid back. Yeah, but I mean Dorothy so, he's got, you know, um uh Laura Dern's character. So mm -hmm. they've Sandy, they've hooked up. Yeah. There's there's something there, but but this one, you know, it looks like it's gonna end so you know, where he's he's basically saying, you know, this kid doesn't know who I am, you know, maybe you should just leave me behind, but then 
the good witch of the north comes right and tells him <laughs> what to do and he does the right thing and after he gets the crap kicked out of him by a bunch of gang guys He's got it well. I mean, sometimes it takes getting the crap kicked out of you to have a moment of clarity. The gangbangers, yeah. <laughs> yeah, sometimes, sometimes. So uh, you want to run down the cast before we get into our discussion? Oh, let me pull up my list. All right. So So we can we can we can do this like I did we talked about that uh, we did last time on when we discussed Dune. So we could break yeah. it down into like Twin Peaks actors, Lynch David Lynch vets and just other mm-hmm. actors. That are so, you know only appear only in this David Lynch movie. Yeah, so I'm gonna I'm gonna sort of go. Through, I'll start with the um, excellent performers who aren't our usual David Lynch okay. group of people. All right, we can start with that. Yeah, so we've got you know the wonderful Nicolas Cage, right? Who gets to put his um, Elvis impersonation skills in this movie. This is probably the character he was born to play, I would argue. He was born to play, I, I think... Maybe this in Raising Arizona. I was going to say, you know, H.I. McDonough and, and Sailor. Those are his two best characters ever, as far as I'm concerned. The, the two best characters he's ever played, ever, and he's yes. he's perfect in them. He's pretty good in Peggy Sue Got Married, also. I've not seen and that he's movie. Pretty, it's good, and I, I think after these two, Moonstruck would be his his most right. fitting role, but I think this and Raising Arizona are his absolute best. Yeah. I agree. He's, he, this is pure Nick Cage right here. Yes. Oh, pure, yeah, purely, purely Nick Cage in the jacket that represents his individuality and his belief in personal freedom. There you go. I was waiting still, for that. So take a drink, everybody. I, I just love it. Yeah. It's, it's, it's going to happen again. Yeah. Um, <laughs> This one also has... Take a look, Dafoe. Sonny. It's going to happen again. It's going to happen again. Yeah. We got Willem Dafoe, who is, you know, like I said, Bobby Peru is just about the only right. person in the world who is as bad of a person <laughs> as Frank as Frank Booth is. Yeah, it's horrible, yes. <laughs> you know, and Willem Dafoe has been in... Everything, 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 yeah. Everything, so, so, uh, everything. He's just, done everything. He's been Jesus, for God's sake. Okay? Just, so, yeah. So, you know, just from the geek front, you know, he was in Spider-Man. He was a Green Goblin in Spider-Man. He was in yeah. Aquaman. Yeah. Did the, did the voice of uh, Gil in Finding Nemo. He was in John Carter. He's in... Uh, John Wick, he's in. Yeah. And so just from a geek in... standpoint alone... He's in my favorite Wes Anderson movie, which is the Grand Budapest Hotel. Yes, yeah, that's it. I agree. That so, is, that's my favorite too. Yeah, and like I said, he was he was Jesus in the controversial Last Temptation of Christ. Right. Willem Dafoe's Jesus. <laughs> so I mean, my God. Um, one of my all-time biggest movie crushes. Right. Kristen Kristen Glover is right. in this movie. Not for very long, but he's in this movie. He plays and Dell, by the way. He plays he plays Dell, and um, like we were saying before, Charles, I think he could be like a Johnny Horn. Yes, he would he would have made a good Johnny Horn because you know he plays a good sort of man child character. Yeah, and Crispin Glover, I just I absolutely adore Crispin Glover. I've seen him live twice. Um. When I met him, I talked his ear off. I probably sounded like a stalker because <laughs> <laughs> I knew he had been in Columbus before. He had, he did a movie in the 80s called Teachers, which was filmed at Central High School in Columbus, which is now COSI. Okay, yeah. So I asked him, I said, have you been to Columbus since you were since you were here in 83? And he kind of like looked at me like, how the hell did you know that? And I said, I said, when your mom is Nick Nolte, you know where Nick Nolte is if he's in your state. Like, <laughs> This movie was a big deal for for us, right? Um, and so, why was he? Why, taught, where where did you meet him at? I'm just kind of curious. At a convention? Uh, no, at the at the uh, Grandview Theater when it was uh, still being here run, in Columbus. Uh, yeah, mm-hmm. still being run by uh, Dave Nedro. He would do like live shows where he would show one of his films, and then he would read some of his poetry, and okay. then answer some questions and it was phenomenal it was phenomenal and he did that twice 
at the Grand View Theater, and so I was able to go to both of those. How was his poetry? Um, very different. I have the, I have the he has three or four books of them, and I have I have three of them, and I can I can show you some of it. It's oh, very... so you liked it enough to get his books. Interesting. Oh, it, I I I have Crispin Glover's record. I love Crispin Glover. Okay. Everything Crispin Glover does, I love. Um, it's very nonlinear. It's very strange. Um, a lot of it is sort of written over other books. It's collage type stuff. It's collage type. So pretty much what you expect from Crispin Glover. Well, the thing about Crispin Glover is that he's, uh, you know, he's most famous for two things, being in Back to the Future and being on Letterman and almost beating the hell out of David Letterman. Yeah. And he told the story, uh, when I saw him about that Letterman show is when he was on Letterman, he was promoting a movie called Reuben and Ed, which is a fantastic movie that is like not in print right now. I think you can watch it on YouTube. Okay. If it ever comes, it, you know, the, if it comes, I think Shout Factory needs to put it out because it's amazing. Yeah. It's one of those quirky early nineties movies that the, you know, the early nineties was like this golden era of like independent movies, independent right. quirky movies. And this is one of them. And Reuben and Ed is a story about two weirdos who wind up getting lost in the desert together. Reuben being Crispin Glover and Ed being Howard Hessman. Interesting. And, and so it's, you know, basically Ed is part of some weird like religion slash business cult. And he comes up with, he meets up with Reuben whose mother is trying to get him to make actual friends in the real world. So they wind up, you know, Ed thinks he's going to get a convert out of Reuben, and Reuben thinks he's going to get his mother to shut up about him finally having a friend. Okay. And then quirky craziness ensues. Well, the character that you see with Letterman is mm-hmm. Reuben. Like, yeah. he was being Reuben. So he was Letterman. he was on, essentially. He was playing that character. Yeah. He just thought it would be funny, and he didn't tell Dave about it because he thought the actual reaction would be more interesting. Okay. So kind of like but an Andy Kaufman type move. Very much like an Andy Kaufman type move. Interesting. And Letterman did not find it funny. He said that he came, he came back stage after he's like, Hey Dave, sorry. Like, and he's just, cause Crispin Glover. Yeah. He, he grew up in the Hollywood. We're going to talk about Chinatown a lot today. Yes. <laughs> um, which, which, Hey, <laughs> Diane Ladd was in. Diane Ladd. And also, um, what's his name? Uh, Daryl Swirling, who has a very bit part in this movie, was okay. Paul Smallway in Chinatown. Okay. So there's there's two people who were in Chinatown in this movie, and one person whose father was in Chinatown in this movie. And Crispin Glover's father was in Chinatown. Crispin Glover's father was in uh, Diamonds of Forever. Right. Um. So Crispin Glover, his name is Bruce Glover. And so Crispin Glover sort of grew up in this kind of Hollywood. Oh, movie. holy crap. I never made that connection. Yeah, that's Crispin so Glover's that's, father. So um, is that Mr. Wynn? Yes. Yes. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, we really need to talk hey, James Bond at one point if you're up for it. That, hey, that would work. Maybe on a drug um, cinema, maybe. That works for me. Yeah. But yeah, Crispin, Crispin Glover grew up in the Hollywood system. So Crispin Glover, you know, he went to you know, Hollywood high and, you know, he, okay. he, he, you know, grew up knowing a lot of people. So he's a very non-traditional type artist. Like when you see his films, like he has one film that um, stars only actors who have down syndrome. And he said he did that because not only does he get to employ yeah. actors with down syndrome, right? but he said that it makes people extremely uncomfortable. And he wants people to examine why they feel uncomfortable about that kind of thing. Interesting. Um, and so his art is very non-traditional. I'll say that. Yeah. Representative like, of it. that. Yeah. He, he, but as a man, like if you listen to him in interviews and if you listen to him talk as a, as a person, he's very pragmatic. He will tell you that he takes movies like, Charlie's Angels and Back to the Future, so he can fund his own projects. Okay. So um, he he I think gets a reputation for being weird because of that Letterman thing. Yeah. And it was it was a decision to promote a character, but he didn't tell anybody about it, so it went off the rails. Frankly. Yeah. Right. But it, he's it, but even, and even when I met him, 
when he was just talking, I mean, when he does his own performances and he's performing his poetry, he's very, uh, what's the word I'm trying to use? He is, he is very nonlinear. He is very yeah. non-traditional. He is very different. He is very kind of bizarre. But right. when you're just talking to him, asking questions, totally normal guy. Interesting. Totally normal guy. Okay. So that's So cool. then again, we have uh, Diane Ladd, who plays Marietta. Who yeah, plays, Marietta Fortune, yeah. Yeah, who plays Lula's mother and who in real life is Lula's mother. Go figure. <laughs> so hooray nepotism. Yeah. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, Diane, Diane Ladd is a fantastic actor. I know, I'm just teasing. And she is Laura Dern's mother. Laura Dern's father Bruce Dern. Sci-fi royalty Bruce Dern. Right, from Silent Running, who, Bruce Dern. From Silent yeah. Running. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so And also she, um, The Hateful Eight, I believe. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I think so. The Quentin Tarantino yeah. movie. Yeah, he plays the um, Confederate general in that one. Um, Bruce Dern is one of those, like, he's like a Peter Fonda type, a yes. real sort of sixties kind of guy. Um, a throwback. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He's like, yeah, he's Peter Fonda is like sort of the best way I can think of to describe it. Yeah. And that's so, a good, that's a good analogy. A good comparison. Yeah. So they, so that's who her, um, that's who her parents are. Her parentage, yeah. Bruce Dern is not in this movie. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he's, no, he's not. Yes. Um, you've got uh, William Morgan Shepard as Mr. Reindeer. Yes. Who I feel like... Who he's... was in a David Lynch film. He was in yes. The Elephant Man. We talked about that. He's one of those... He was one of the guys at the bar when um, the porter is trying to round people up. Oh, is that him? Yeah, was that's him. That? That's what this W. Morgan Shepard. Yeah, because I, I was watching this again, and I'm thinking, why do I know him? And it's because he's in the Transformers movies. Well, he's in, he's in everything. He was on Doctor Who yeah. as uh, the old Canton Everett Delaware the Third, and yeah. he was, I just watched him. Believe it or not, earlier tonight when Lori and I were watching Babylon Five mm-hmm. on on HBO Max, he's in the the Soul Hunters episode, which is like the third episode okay. of Babylon Five. But he's been okay. in like everything. He was on. Obviously, he played Blank Reg on on uh, Max Headroom. That's oh my where, god! That's where I first got to know him. Oh my god! It's been so long since I've seen that. Yeah. I just I remember watching his character and thinking he's a fantastic actor. Uh, yeah, he's a great actor, and his character kind of reminds me of Angela Battlemonte's character in Mulholland Drive. Yes. Yeah. They're I think they're very similar characters. They're very um, you know very quiet, deliberate, um, standoffish. But like gangsters, got the guy in charge, exactly a gangster. Yeah, essentially, like yes. gangsters. Um, and then Santos, the the hitman who you call when Harry Dean Stanton ain't get the job done, is played by J.E. Freeman. Mm-hmm. And when it comes to main cast, that's it for people who haven't been in David Lynch movies. Yeah, <laughs> we've got major David Lynch players like Laura Dern as Lula, right? Um, Isabella Rossellini as Perdita. Yep. And of course, Harry Dean Stanton is Johnny Farragut, who uh, Marietta sends after right. Lula and Sailor when Sailor gets out of jail the first time. Although he's not particularly, he's like, look, uh, he's a free man. He did his time. She's of age. If she went with him willingly, there's not a whole hell of a lot I can do for you. So that's when she has to call in Santos because Santos is going to get stuff done. Um, we've got, uh, he gets Johnny done. Apparently he does. He gets Johnny. Yeah, takes, done. He takes him off the board. We have Grace Zabriskie <sighs> in another wonderful Grace Zabriskie performance as Juana. Yeah. Juana Durango. Um, Juana Durango. Um, Sherilyn Fenn, who like we already talked about is the girl in the accident who her mother's going to kill her for losing her purse. Right. Where's my hairbrush? So yeah. it's just, it's so tragic. It's like it's something sticky in my hair. There's something sticky in my hair and it's her yeah. back her of brains. Her, is her brains, yeah, yeah, pretty much. Um, we've got uh, Marvin Kaplan who plays the disgusting Uncle Pooch. And uh, Marvin Kaplan is Mr. McGonagall in On the Air. Oh, okay. So I didn't make another... that, I didn't catch that one. 
Yeah, he's. I'm just. I'm just running through all the Lynch players because yeah. they're, they're all. Freddie they're Freddie all Jones plays George Kovich. He's the, George Kovich. The guy doing the 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 has the duck voice, the Donald Duck mm-hmm. voice. He has the weird Donald. Yeah, he's the weird Donald Duck what? voice. And then of course we've got what? Um, David Patrick Kelly as a uh, drop shadow yeah. who works with uh, Reggie, who is played by Calvin Lockhart, who is the electrician in Fire Walk with Me. Mm-hmm. And so we've got some other we've got some other sort of minor players here that I want to bring up. Um, like I said, uh, very very small, very very small part. Um, uh, one of the managers of the of Coco Taylor, who is an actual blues singer who mm-hmm. sings at the Zanzibar. Right. Um, her manager is played with by the Daryl Zanzibar Zerling. Barbarians, right? Yeah, yeah the Zanzibar Barbarians. Um, Daryl Swirling plays her manager, and he was in Chinatown with Diane Ladd. He played Hollis Mulroy. Okay. In Chinatown. So, got a lot of Chinatown connectivity here. So, like I said, we have Calvin Lockhart as Reggie, and then at the very end of this movie, we see a guy in a wheelchair, played by Nick Love, who is Malcolm, who is the guy that plays Malcolm Sloan in Twin Peaks. He's the the uh, Evelyn Marsh's brother during oh. the James Hurley saga. Okay. I missed that yep. connection too. And then um, at one of the hotels, we see the desk clerk is played uh, by um, Ed Wright, who is our old favorite Del Nibbler mm-hmm. in Twin Peaks. Right. Um, one of the dancers of the reindeer is played by Lisa Ann Cabasa, who plays Jenny in Twin Peaks. Jenny is who Audrey gets the phone, Blackie's phone number from after she lost it, after she talked to Emery Battis. Oh. She's, what, she's that person. Nice. And then we have uh, Frank Collison, who plays Timmy. And he's Muddy in Twin Peaks The Return, one of the guys who's there during the infamous arm wrestling scene. Oh, okay. Yep. And one, of the, one of the guys in the background. Yeah. In the crowd. Yeah. Yeah. An actress named uh, Charlie Spradling plays Irma. And she's one of the, she's Swabby, one of Blackie's ladies of the night. Okay. And then there's a, uh, the actor who plays Rex is somebody named Eddie Dixon, who has been in some David Lynch short films. And of course, let's not forget that this is a David Lynch movie. And of course, so Jack Nance is in this movie. Yes. As Double O Spool. Yes, Double O Spool. And there are, I don't know if you watched this. um, It was very unpleasant as well. Yes. Yeah. A couple of years ago, Shout Factory put out this on Blu-ray finally, finally. Right. So the Blu-ray, I don't know if you watch these, Charles, but the Blu-ray had some deleted scenes. Yep. And there's a deleted scene featuring Tracy Walter, who is one of the greatest character actors in the yes. history of character actors. Uh, most famously that we discussed, he's Bob in Batman 1989. Right. But he also plays a Blinky Watch on, in On the Air. Yeah. So See, I, I, got, del- I got to know him from playing Frog on um, Best of the West. Yeah, yeah. I think my first, the first time I ever really noticed who he was, was Batman 1989. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, that guy is in freaking everything. Yeah. You know, he's in, he's in, uh, Repo Man, which we should also do on Drunk Cinema. Yeah, we should. We should do that. Um, but yeah, even the deleted scenes are filled with David Lynch players. And like I said, because this yeah. movie was made around the time of Twin Peaks, I think David Lynch was like, you know, He's like, hey, Charlie, you want to be in this movie? <laughs> <laughs> right. Just, yeah, there's, there's He's probably a just, of- he probably like made a bunch of phone calls and like, oh, you, uh, you got some time to do this scene or whatever. And yeah, if they were available, he, they're in the movie. If they weren't available, they're not in the movie. I forgot all about this. I lift up Francis Bay as yes. the matter. Yep. I was just uh, going to, I was just going to mention her. Yep. And of course, Cheryl Lee as the good witch yep. who tells Lula, who tells Sailor, hey, if she basically, you know, spoilers, she basically tells Sailor that if Lula can forgive you for killing her father, I think that's true love. Yeah. Don't turn away from love, Sailor. Don't turn away from love, Sailor. Yeah. So, yeah, we got a lot of. Uh, yeah. And, Cher- you know, Shirley doing her incredible baby doll voice that she kind of did know. as Laura every Perfect. so often. Yeah. Perfect voice. I don't know, Charles, did you watch um, Bird Box? The movie Bird Box? No, 
I mean, I know of it, but I, I have not seen it. Yeah. With um, uh, Sandra Bullock, probably, right? Right. And Pruitt Taylor Vince. Yeah. So okay. I feel like we should mention uh, one of his more recent, recent things. Pruitt Taylor Vince, who um, is in one of my all time favorite movies, Angel Heart. But um, he's also pretty well known for being in True Blood and Deadwood. Mm-hmm. And, you know, see, those I've seen. Those I've seen. On Showtime, actually. He's very famous for being on Showtime. <laughs> <laughs> right. So. Okay. Have so. Have getting in my cast? No, I think I, w- I was going to bring up Francis Bay, but you got it. You, you kind of, yeah. you, you went back and you caught it, caught that one. But I think that's yep. it. Yeah, I think that's everything I've got. All right. Um, so this movie, two hours, four minutes, not that long compared to some. Diane Ladd received an Oscar nomination for Best Supporting Actress for this movie. Heck yeah. But, of course, she lost to Whoopi Goldberg in Ghost. Also good. Yeah. So yeah. it's kind of hard to be upset about that one, really. And, of course, we this is a score by Angelo Badalamenti. So I thought that was, you know, obviously very fitting. And uh, this apparently was a sort of success because it made, this one actually made money. Mm-hmm. Uh, unlike Dune, it grossed $14.6 million from a $10 million budget. And in the summer of 1989, this, is, this movie was uh, done after David Lynch had filmed the pilot episode for Twin Peaks. So essentially this is, this, this was filmed between the pilot and the actual series. Right. Yeah. Right. So apparently independent production company, Propaganda Films, they commissioned Lynch to develop an updated noir screenplay based on the 1940s crime novel. But Monty Montgomery, yeah, the cowboy, uh, who was a friend of Lynch's and associate producer on Twin Peaks, asked Barry Gifford, the, the novelist, like I said, this book is based on, what he was working on. And Gifford, Gifford said, well, I'm working on this manuscript for Wild at Heart, the story of Sailor and Lula, but I've got like two more chapters to write. So the book wasn't even finished yet. Right. But he let Monty Montgomery read it in a pre-published galley form while the producer was working on um, the pilot episode for Twin Peaks while Lynch was working on that. So Mon- Montgomery read it and... Two days later, he called Gifford and said, okay, I want to make a film of this. And then two days after that, Montgomery gave uh, Gifford's book to Lynch while he was editing the pilot and asked him if he would be an executive producer on a film adaptation and would he like to direct. And Lynch said, well, okay, let me read the book. Montgomery didn't think he would like it. Kind of like Dune, right? And, Mm -hmm. but he ended up loving it and he's like, okay, so he calls Barry Gifford and he asked him if he could do the film, make a film of it. And Lynch was apparently drawn to what he saw as, quote, a really modern romance in a violent world, a picture about finding love in hell, unquote. So that's, that's how he views it, this one. So essentially he's like seeing this, you know, this this flame of love inside hell, I guess, which is probably why you see a lot of in this movie, you see a lot of fire um, imagery flames, you a lot know, of fire it, imagery, a lot of, a lot of, uh, you know, dudes getting set on fire. If, you get a sailor lighting up a cigarette, all everything. And if Diane Ladd with lipstick all over her face, doesn't look like the devil. I don't know what does. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. But uh, I talked about how Lynch didn't like the original ending for the novel. Mm-hmm. Where Sailor and Lula actually split up for good. I know. It's not right. It's not what needs to happen. Yeah. So he's like, okay, screw that. I'm going to, like, change this. And, then he, of course, he added new characters like Mr. Reindeer and Sherilyn's Fenn character. Sherilyn Fenn's character, excuse me. Mm-hmm. You know, the victim of the car accident. Right. And then apparently at one point, um, Nick Cage, this is pretty well known, that he called David Lynch and asked if he could wear a snakeskin jacket. <laughs> in the movie, and Lynch said, "Okay, and I'll put it in the script." And he put it in the script. As well, he should have. As well as he should have. Yeah, that's a fantastic addition to that character because 
Sailor does believe in individuality and, and personal freedom. Take a drink, everybody. So there you go. Yeah, take a drink. There it is. <laughs> Okay, originally, uh, this movie was going to feature more explicit erotic scenes between Sailor and Lula. In one, she had an orgasm while relating to Sailor a dream she had of being ripped open by a wild animal. Well, that probably would be a trip because it'd be your last one. Yeah, pretty much. (laughs) Yeah. And then another deleted scene had Lula, Lula lowering herself onto Sailor's face saying, take a bite of Lula. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, yeah, it'd probably be a good call to get rid of those, right? Yeah, and I and I because there's um, enough going on in this movie already. Yeah, and and personally, I really like the um, the visual of Lula's orgasms being her hands. You know, her hand just. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Clenching up, so, and tightening, and yeah. Yeah. So, like when she's with. Bobby Peru, you know it happens, and she feels horrible about it. So, I mean, I like that. I like that visual being our our key to Lula. Yeah. Now, early test screenings for the movie didn't go well. Surprise. With the strong oh. violence in some scenes being too much for people. And I'm trying to figure out what was it that changed us as a movie going public, right? My thought is, I think things just changed with Pulp Fiction. Well, not just Pulp Fiction, but other things too. Yeah, but I, I feel like David like Lynch I, films probably. David Lynch films a little bit, but like I said, I feel like Tarantino Pulp, movies definitely. Yeah, Pulp Fiction was this marker in the history of film when we were like, all of a sudden, a little bit more as a general audience, yeah, general culture and audience, we were more okay with. Well, Anti heroes, yeah, liking liking characters who are disgusting, disgusting romances, things like that. Because it's you know, if you watch this movie, this movie is so much better than something like Natural Born Killers. But Natural Born Killers was a huge success. Yes, and, and you so know, I'm just we were. The, it was the '90s. Was it? it was the '90s. We were in our grunge phase. So you know, and it's I, I've heard a lot of things about. The you Robert know, Rodriguez just, movies were, you know, after, after Tarantino, Robert Rodriguez Tarantino, made a Robert scene Rodriguez, with things Despar- like things like and, Desperado and and even Sin even City. things like even things like OJ, where yeah. we were on the news every day for a year, was this incredibly violent story that just became right background noise. And I, I heard something interesting about the OJ trial and how it affected pop culture. <laughs> Um, the musical Chicago mm-hmm. did not do very well when it first came out. I mean, it was okay, but it wasn't a hugely popular musical and it didn't stay on Broadway for a terribly long amount of time. And then when it had its revival in like 96, I think it was 95 or 96. Yeah. It was much more successful. And the theory behind that was that after the OJ trial, people believed much more, they they had a better time believing that you could get away with murder and be still be like a popular hero, which is what happens in the in the musical Chicago. Okay, but at the time in the seventies when it first premiered, it was like, what? This is ridiculous. How this would never happen? But after the OJ trial, it's much more credible. Yeah, it was much more credible. People were willing to believe that this woman could kill her husband and get away with it and become the smoke hero. Interesting. Yeah. So it just we became a nation of cynics, really. A nation of cynics and a nation of people who just don't get shocked as quickly as as we used to about violent things. We're numb to it now. We're yeah, we're a little more numb. I look how fast. I I mean, we we rebound after school shootings for crying out loud. As a nation, and there's so many of them, and now it's just sort of like, okay, this is what we do. Yeah, how we deal with it. You know, it's it's very. You get numb to it. Yeah, you have to. Otherwise, you couldn't move. Right. You know? You get either, so, you're either you either paralyzed or you try to accept it and move on. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, I actually did a project in college about Pulp Fiction and how it changed this as audiences. Because, mm-hmm. and what I did is I read, I had uh, 
um, I borrowed my friend Shelley's copy of the script mm-hmm. and I read the scene where Marvin gets shot in the face. Right. And everybody's laughing in the class. And I'm like, this is something, this is how we're different now. This is not something we yeah. used to be able to see. So I don't know what, it, I don't know how, what happened in those four years that we go from wild at heart, you know, being seen as too violent or too disgusting or too yeah. um, unsavory to having Pulp Fiction be up for an Oscar. Well, you know what and, I think what it was? I mean, it was part of it was because the violence in, in Pulp Fiction, and this is just my opinion, the, vi- the violence in Pulp Fiction is offset by dark humor. Like, it, it you know, it's very tongue in cheek. Like, it is very it, like like even though you know you know when the when um the you know, like like when the when the um, the gun goes off in the car in Pulp Fiction yeah Marvin it, gets shot oh, Marvin gets shot, shot yeah, Marvin in the yeah, face exactly and then and there's this this whole comedy of errors mm-hmm. with that follows with um okay well how do we get rid of this body yeah and there's there there's a but I, I feel like. Well, I guess it all goes back to the fact that nobody yeah. understands David Lynch's sense of humor. Yeah. Because I feel like I think I feel like this one also has dark comedy in it as well, and a love story, a love right. story that I think that you're really, really rooting for, even though we find out that no matter how much Sailor loves Lula, he is the one that killed her father. Right. So it's almost like you don't know why you're rooting for these people. Well, he was there. Yeah. He was there, but he was part of the he was part of the group that killed his father, yeah. killed yeah. her father. Yeah, right. Yeah, he was doing some so, work for Santos, and yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, which is how you know he's he's filled with secrets. Right, exactly. He's oh, that's and if, very and nice, if very Lula's, nicely done, by the way. If Lula's willing to forgive him everything, then he mm-hmm. needs to give her a chance. Yeah. So, but um, so after the first test screening of this. 80 people walked out because of the graphic torture scene involving Johnny Farragut. Like apparently yeah. It was really bad. Lynch didn't want to cut anything. So they had a second test screening and a hundred people walked out of that one. So at that point, okay. so at that point, you know, that's 20 plus more people, right? So he's like, okay, he agreed to tone it down. And cause he looked at, it, he's like, okay, this is killing the film. So he agreed to do changes and cut it. Well, and, and but and no he matter... only did that for the domestic audience because yeah. apparently, you know, this movie, um, this was done, you know, this was before uh, the NC-17 rating. So if they hadn't, uh, the MPAA, the Motion Picture Association of America, said we're going to give this an X rating. And an X rating. Which is the kiss of death for a movie back then. Kiss of Death for a movie because an X rating didn't necessarily mean porn, right. but a lot of times it was thought of as porn yeah. because porn is is triple X. Yes, but but an X rating like some famous movies that got X ratings were Midnight Cowboy, mm-hmm. Clockwork Orange, things like that. Who which yes, there's boobies in Clockwork Orange, and yes, there's male prostitutes in. Midnight Cowboy. Today it would get an R, by the way. It's not, I mean, it's, it's not about the sex. It's about yeah, the, the, the violence. Movie. Yeah. Also, also X rated was Caligula. That's also, that's pretty much porn. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So a lot of movies that did get X ratings were, didn't, um, oh, what was that? What was that one movie in the 90s that got an X rating? Was it Henry and June? I can't did remember. That, I can't remember. Did that one get a X rating? I was too busy watching Twin Peaks. I can't remember. No. Yeah, that was it. <laughs> That's all right. But so, yeah, but apparently this is only in North America. Well, yeah. Zane's looking this up because, you know, the foreign audiences, they're okay with it. So Lynch also made the change to the scene where Bobby Peru accidentally shoots his own head off with a shotgun, you know, mm-hmm. when he stumbles. Henry and June is, is an X rating. Is that it? It's one of uh, – actually, it was technically an NC-17. I think it became having an NC-17. Is that the first one with NC-17? This year might have been what did NC-17. Okay. You know, it was nominated for uh, for um, Oscars. 
it's the it, there's only three NC-17 movies to receive Oscar nominations. Uh, Henry and June, Wild at Heart, and Requiem for a Dream. Interesting. Oh, no. But yeah, X ratings, there are theaters that would not play X rated movies. And I want to say to this day, AMC theaters will not, will not play NC-17 movies. Yeah, I've known, I can't remember seeing one over there. So if you get if you get an NC seventeen rating, that just basically means your mainstream audience has been cut. Right. You must you might as well kiss your box office goodbye. Yeah. 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 Tremendously. Yeah. Uh, this movie also features the Chris Isaac song Wicked Game, for which David Lynch did a music video. He directed the music yeah. video of that. Doesn't this one also have blue Spanish eyes? Uh, no, I don't know. I don't think so, but I could be wrong. I don't remember hearing that. Well, you know, Charles, we just got to go upstairs and get the soundtrack. And All right. Know. Well, okay. <laughs> it might be on the soundtrack, but maybe it wasn't in the film. It could have been one of those. Yeah. Yeah. Because been... you know, you know what I'm talking about. That sometimes they add stuff that's not in the film. Yeah, or it could have been in a deleted scene, but just stayed on the soundtrack. That kind right. of thing. Yeah. I'm just trying to figure out why I think that. <laughs> I mean, it's not the same um, Chris Isaac album. Yeah, it is. That Wicked Game is on. Blue Spanish Sky, right yep. there. Okay. So it's on the soundtrack, at least. Yep. Yeah, I can't remember it in the movie, though. Unless it was, like, really quiet. It's in the it's in the background somewhere in one of yeah. the CD bars they go into. I just forget which one. Okay. I'll take your word for it. So that's all I got for trivia. It's a lot. Well, that's, all, that's, pretty, that's pretty good trivia. Yeah, I thought yeah. so. I was trying to get the really good stuff, so... Okay, so yeah, the only uh, other thing I was going to mention, mm-hmm. the only other thing I was going to mention about trivia about this movie is yeah. that um, the 1997 movie Dance with the Devil, starring Javier Bardem and Rosie Perez, mm-hmm. is originally the original title was Perdita Durango, and it was based on another novel. Yeah, there's like six of them novels apparently. Yeah, another novel by Barry Gifford about the Perdita Durango character that is played by Isabella Rossellini in this movie. Right. So that was the only other thing I was going to mention about trivia. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's a good one because it's, yeah, it's another book in the series, only a, mm-hmm. a separate film, but, yep. but there are related characters in that. So it's almost like a universe, yep. a book universe. This is the weirdest cover to the soundtrack because when yeah. does Lula wear this outfit? I can, I, hold on. It's, there's a little bit of glare. You have to turn it kind of angled. There we go. Okay. Yeah. yeah, exactly. She never, wears out, she never wears this out. So yeah, this is an excellent this is an excellent soundtrack. Um what else is on that? Nicholas Cage singing both Love Me and Love Me Tender. Right. So it's totally worth it for that. Yeah. Um Everybody kinda got, kinda considers that song Treat Me But Like a Fool, but that's the subtitle. No, the name of the song is called Love Me. It's called Love Me because yeah. 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 Um and like you mentioned, uh, Wicked Game, Blue Spanish Sky, right? Um, uh, Perdita by River City, and of course, Slaughterhouse by Power Mad. Nice. You gotta have that one. And uh, this also has a cool catwalk. Right. By Julia Cruz. Which, well, no, this is the instrumental. The oh. um, the Angelo Badalamenti and wound up on Julie Cruz's record. Yeah. Uh, with with lyrics. Yeah, yeah, it's this a, has, this has it's on her second album. Yeah, that red one with the mashed potato head. Yeah, exactly. The, yeah. Potato, the one that looks like something designed by David Lynch. Yes, exactly. Which it is. <laughs> it is. It is designed yeah, by David is. Lynch. That makes mm-hmm. sense. Yeah, and then there's there's uh, pieces um, there's pieces by Angelo on this, and then um, up in flames by the by the great Coco Taylor, who okay. is in the movie as well. So okay, interesting. Well, you know, we've talked like 45 minutes and we just, you know, we just scratched the surface of this. We haven't even discussed the actual plot yet. Oh, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> white trash girl has yeah, that... upbringing. Yeah. White trash boy becomes a criminal. He helps kill her dad. They meet later. They fall in love. Yep. They, basically, they basically F their way across the entire country. Yep. And uh, wackiness ensues. Yes. And... Her mother is and not tons happy. of Wizard of Oz references. That's the plot. Lots of Wizard of I I absolutely adore the scene where they're driving at night yeah. and she looks out and she sees Diane Ladd as the Wicked Witch following them. 
Right. Kind of like with Dorothy, you know, seeing the, the you know, the, um, her. Mrs. Gulch on her Mrs. bike. Mrs. Gulch, becoming, yeah, turning into the Wicked yeah. Witch. Yeah, in the, in the tornado. Yep. Yes. In the twister. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Aw. What? Sorry, Cicely, Cicely Tyson died. Aw. I just, I just looked at my phone and Cicely Tyson died. So yeah. it's been a sad week. Yeah, it has. I mean, you know, we're going to talk yeah. more on Drunk Cinema about why it was a sad week. We're going to talk more on Drunk Cinema in our next but, episode. Um, but we'll, t- we'll let you know if we're about that later. Because the thing, the thing is, Marietta is, if, if you think, um, Laura Palmer's mother is yes, crazy. Right. You think oh, Sarah man. Palmer is the word? <laughs> you think Sarah Palmer is the craziest mom you've ever seen? Oh, goodness. Yes. No. Yeah. So yep. Marietta basically goes completely cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs in this one. Yeah, because say what you want to about Sarah Palmer. She never tried to have sex with Bobby or James. Right. And I can't say the same for Marietta. <laughs> well, apparently the the frog bug or whatever inside her, the frog moth, yeah. was in the, up frog, for that. Yeah. The frog moth, that's it. Yeah, that's the thing, because Marietta has all kinds of gentleman friends who are unsavory people. Yeah. You know, she's she's telling Johnny she's in love with him, but she's two-timing him sexually and professionally yeah. with Santos. She knows Santos is who killed her husband. Right. Well, I see the vibe I got, though, I thought that she wanted Santos to kill her husband. Yeah, she did. Okay. She wanted her husband, for sure. Yeah. So she knows that, but she's still, I mean, you know. And then apparently because because Sailor worked for Santos, he was there. Right. He was there, and she knows it. And so that's half of why I think she wants Sailor to stay away from Lula, because I don't think she wants, Lula really loved her father. You think she's afraid of the truth coming out? She's afraid of the truth coming out, and part of her wants Sailor for herself. Well, there is that, because there's that great yeah. opening, one of the early opening scenes is that she's, like, drunk off her ass. and goes, Lula's mama. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so she goes into the men's room as Sailor's taking a whiz and um, confronts him right there at the urinal. Do you want to F Lula's mama? Yeah, it's <laughs> yeah, basically. gross. Yeah. It's really, really. Right. And obviously. And then, and then, like, you know, she drag like, end up going into a bathroom stall. She, like, mm-hmm. leads him to the bathroom stall. So we and figure, well, they're going to have bathroom sex, right? And they do not. They do not because they so, basically get into an argument. Because Sailor loves Lula. Right. You know, and. As we, the, the reason, and that's Although I have no Sailor. idea, because Sailor, obviously, he's the king of bad decisions. I have no idea why he went into that bathroom stall in the first place. Um, I guess to have a private conversation. I know. <laughs> I a, know. Like, how are you going to have a private conversation? Because you can always hear. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Seriously. So here's, here's the thing, though, about... Sailor is that the night that this happens is the night that Sailor kills somebody and has to go to jail. That's why he's in jail the first. Yeah, because uh, Marietta hires this guy, um, mm-hmm. Lemon Bob Ray Lemon, yep. to uh, to basically shank him with a, a um, switchblade. Mm-hmm. And so Lula sees it, says Sailor, he's got a knife, and then yep. Sailor just whacks his head into every marble <sighs> surface. Theater. Yeah, he doesn't just beat the guy up or knock him out. He just like he, he pummels him literally to death on everything with his, with his bare hands. Like he takes him Those right into hands. the railing of a of a staircase, and you know, and then under the stairs. Yeah, yeah, the hands that are probably all over my baby right now. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Manslaughter. <laughs> yeah. Um, I love. I just love the way Nick Cage says manslaughter, manslaughter. doing yeah. it in the Elvis voice. It's hilarious because he only does twenty two months. For yeah, this. yeah. I was like, well, that's not so, that bad for manslaughter that's for for killing something. Yeah, and it's now keep in mind it was I like Georgia it, or something, right? Oh, I'm sure there's some sort of disgusting racist element to it as well. Well, but... for one thing, for one thing, he killed the black guy, so he probably got off light because of that. In the, in, in, in the, in the south. south, yes, yeah, yeah, probably the south, the, the south. 
I was surprised. I'm surprised he even got jail time, personally. To quote Dave Chappelle, yeah. Have you ever been to the South? Oh, the racism down there, magnifique. <laughs> So, yes, uh, the South I mean, is extremely, extremely racist. I lived in Florida for a couple of years, and which is why I'm back in Ohio now. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, and Florida is its own brand of, like, you know, woohoo craziness. But anyway. Well, yeah, that's a whole different I – could, I could spend a whole other podcast on that one. So, Sailor um, kills this guy, and I, I think he probably only got 22 months because this guy probably – had a criminal record and he was trying to kill Sailor. Right, it was self defense. It was very much. It was it was overzealous self defense. Yeah. It's like it was self defense plus, you know. Yeah. It was self defense and about change ten... and change, yeah, yeah. <laughs> accidental change. It's you gave you gave ten dollars worth of self defense, but you got change for a fifty. Yeah, pretty much, <laughs> pretty much, yeah. So, um, so that's why Sailor goes to jail in the first place. And um, in the PD Correctional Facility, in the Maricopa County State Correctional Facility for Men, State Route Number Twenty Five, Tempe, Arizona. I'll be waiting. Nice. Yeah, all the best movies of Nicolas Cage are him either not having a hand or being in prison. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, the, the Rock. Uh, yeah, I suppose. But anyway, yeah. so yeah. the uh, and again, I think the reason why he gets so crazy is because. Lula's there and he's talking about Lula's mama and Lula's father and he doesn't want Lula to find the truth. Yeah. So that's why that happens. Yeah. So like 22 minutes later, Mm -hmm. um, despite Marietta telling her that she should never see Sailor again, Lula apparently runs off to reunite after he gets out of the joint. Right. She's there to pick him up. She picks him up. She gets, gives him a snakeskin jacket. Oh, my snakeskin jacket. He's so excited yeah, to have exactly. that back. He, yeah, he, she yes. picks him up. They go on a road trip. They get a hotel room. They go see Power Man. Yeah. And after lots and lots they, of sex. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. So, so we, we, we have sex and then we celebrate with speed metal dancing. And I love how the speed metal band knows how to play love me by elvis Presley. right that was that's the most hilarious thing about that scene well there's there's two hilarious things there's the t- the part where the guy um tries to put the moves on lula you just tried on the wrong girl <laughs> yeah pretty much and so so um sailor you know punches him and then says no now apologize yeah exactly. i want you to apologize to my girl <laughs> i want you to get a manual Anyway, yeah. um, but yeah, I love that this band. But they just stop, uh, you know, like right in the middle when when Sailor says "cut the music," yeah. you know, he points and these they cut the music and they just do it. Yeah, and they just do they it, just do and it. then you know, and then afterwards, you know, after he has the guy apologize and the guy like you know wimps and you know walks away in a real wimpish way, he you know he's like he he gestures to the band or something, and they start playing. You know, they start doing "Love Me." Right, and Which, I love that there's this, this this speed metal band. Yeah, with one of them's wearing a Guar T-shirt. Right, and but they have this wonderfully gentle, great version of "Love Me" by Elvis Presley. It's awesome. Well, you know that's when, when, I, when, they, when they do wedding uh, wedding receptions. That's what they sing, yeah. probably. I, I and I just would like to make this clear: Power Mad is an actual band. Right. They're from, they're an actual speed metal band. They're from Minneapolis, so they yeah they're they're a real thing. <laughs> <laughs> so that's cool. So um, so Lula then added, this is where we, something that pays off at the very end of the film, where she asks Sailor why he does he never sings "Love Me Tender" to because he's only going to sing that to his wife, right? Foreshadowing. Pretty much, pretty much, yeah. yeah. So again, this is probably like one of the most coherent storylines that David Lynch has ever told. Yeah, yeah, it's and because of because of that, when she says, you know, you you always told me it's my your favorite song. Why mm-hmm. you sing it to me? Blah blah blah. And he's all only ever seen that to my wife. And then at the end, when he does, I'm crying. I'm like, yay! Right. I'm so happy for Sailor and Lula. And 
Pace is there and, uh, looking up at Pace, it. Little Pace with his little mullet. He's his all little smile. Mullet. He's like, yee. Ah, it's so, it's so cute. Yeah. So, um, so Marietta, not happy by this point. No, she's not happy. So she gets Johnny, her private investigator and part-time boyfriend, Johnny mm-hmm. Farragut, this is Harry Dean Stanton's character, to find Lula, bring her home. And but Johnny kind of uh, doesn't he doesn't uh, succeed at his job. You know, he basically try you know, like he he follows them from hotel to hotel. Mm-hmm. Like but he it, just knows where they are, yeah. Right. Until there's he ends up deleted, in New Orleans, which is a big there's mistake. There's a great deleted. There's a great deleted scene yeah. where he sees them. He's at the Cafe Du Monde. He's eating a beignet, obviously. Right. And uh, he sees them, and he just. He just sort of raises his coffee cup and toasts them. He's like, "Ain't love grandkids." Like he's just he's kind of happy them. he's kind of happy that these two weirdo kids found each other because I think he probably knows that Marietta. I mean, aside from the fact that she, you know, kicks the crap out of uh, out of um, Uncle Pooch when right. she comes home and finds that Uncle Pooch has has raped Lula. Yeah. Aside from beating the crap out of him, I don't think she's much of a mom. <laughs> <laughs> And Johnny knows that. So I think right. Johnny's just, you know, happy that, you know, he knows Lula's had a hard time of it. He knows Sailor. So he's had rooting a hard for time. Lula is what you yeah. I think he's rooting for the two of them. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. And he, I think he wants Lula to be happy and he knows that uh Probably she needs to get away from her mom. She'd be a lot happier if she got away from her Marietta. mom. And Marietta is gonna be better off if she lets go and lets Lula grow up. Yeah. Probably. Right. So, like, like Lula says, you know, maybe she loves me a little too much. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Possessive. Yeah, pretty much. I wouldn't know a thing about that with my mom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, the... Really, uh, your, mom, your mom's kind of older, and you're an only child. I wonder... Mm. Huh. I've never heard of that before. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> hmm. Yeah. Uh, so with, with Johnny kind of failing, don't, you know, failing on the job, Marietta turns to Marcella Santos, who's another of her boyfriends and also a horrible, horrible person. And who is the guy that she hired to kill her husband? Yeah. yeah. (laughs) So he says, you know, so they go through the whole thing of, um, okay, I want you to kill Sailor and Santos arranges it. He, this is where he, um. He does that whole like silver dollar thing with um, uh, Mr. Reindeer. And apparently they got a whole system. Like if you present a silver dollar with the details, Mr. Reindeer will make that happen. So essentially Mr. Reindeer is the uh, middleman that, that the go between, between the client and the assassin. I feel like Mr. Reindeer is doing this for way too cheap. Right, the silver dollar. I mean, it, you should be getting paid more than a silver dollar, Mr. Reindeer. Well, no, well, no. I think the silver dollar is just like there's money, but the money is I'm, left in a I'm anonymous. A joke. Oh, okay, all right. I'm making a joke, Charles. Okay, <laughs> I wasn't sure. It's nine o'clock at night. No, you know, I've had a long day, so I'm, you have to bear with me. I'm sure that he gets paid more than a silver dollar. I would I'm hope so. Me. Yeah. Yes. But uh, yeah, I thought you know just. Apparently that's just like the, um, like a, it's supposed to represent the transaction. So it's it's sort of the coin of the, it's it's the coin of the realm essentially. Yeah. yeah. That you have to it's it's your your uh, golden ticket. What's a, good, what's a good example? It's your <laughs> golden ticket. It's your uh, yeah. it's your other half of the Jello box, I guess. Do you know that story? No. About the uh, the the Rosenbergs that when they were meeting up with people, somebody had cut a part of a jello box and gave them both halves and when they met the other person that's how they knew they met their contact oh i didn't so, know that interesting yeah I learned, something. Look, I learned something today kids i'll have to i'll have to look that one up yeah that's interesting the, that sounds interesting that so uh yeah so santos gets a hold of mr reindeer mr reindeer gets a hold of his crew including joanna that's grace mm-hmm. zabriskie's character reggie and drop shadow so, uh, uh, who is who is so great? He's David Patrick Kelly, and he's so fantastic. I think I'm high. 
That's the one. Yeah. You, you didn't think I was going to let that slide, did you? I'm, I was glad you didn't, yeah. frankly. All right. So they, they basically – so the hit's on. Oh, okay. There's a link there. Okay. Right, let's check that out later. Yeah, check that out later. I'll check, we'll check that out. Obviously, we're we'll doing. Obviously, we're a little busy right now with the podcast. So I'm gonna. Yeah, uh, I just, I just didn't want to forget. No, no, I'm glad you did. I'm glad you did. So thanks for the link. So, um, but Marietta, so now that she sent these events in motion, she has a crisis of conscience, and she tries to set out. She goes to uh, goes to Johnny because she's worried that something's going to happen to Johnny. Marcelo Santos keeps hint- hinting that he's going to take Johnny off the board. And even Johnny was like, you didn't bring Santos in on this, Juju. Like, Johnny knows that Santos right. is bad freaking news. Yeah. You know? So there's a lot going on here. So. Yeah. So Sailor. Really shady players on the board right now. Yeah. And Sailor kind of like gets a little um, senses of disturbance in the force. So he goes to. Sailor's worked for these people before. He knows right. their MO. You know? Right. So he, so he essentially. They leave North Carolina. They go to Cal- they head to California, but they first stop in New Orleans, and then then they go on the road again, and then they end up in Big Tuna. Oh, I'm sorry. No, this is I'm trying to I'm trying to keep the the the, the timeline straight. So so does he go like after getting a wind of this? Do you think that he goes to Perdita at this point? Or is that later? That's when he goes. That's when he gets with Perdita. Yeah. So Perdita, because apparently they knew each other back in the day, supposedly, and they made some deal that okay, if they, I'll tell you if there's a hit out on you, and then you tell me if there's a hit out on me. Exactly. They have this deal that if they ever got word of each other's right. demise, they Contract, they would yeah. give each other yeah, mm-hmm. they would give each other the heads up. Yeah. And. uh it almost looks like, you know, she lives in the apartment that Laura Palmer lives in at the end of the return. <laughs> yes. Yes. I was just thinking. It's a very yeah. seedy looking joint. Yeah, that's um that's uh oh, what's her name? Cass no Cassie. Um shoot, I'm blanking Carrie. on Carrie, Carrie, Carrie. Pages. Mm-hmm. Yes, Carrie Page, that's it. Yeah. Thank Carrie you. Page. Yeah, that look does look like Carrie Page's house a lot. Probably has a rotting dead guy in it too. I don't know. I didn't see the inside. <laughs> right. <laughs> Maybe he's killed by Santos. Who knows? Um, so apparently, uh, so was it um, Marietta ends up getting with Johnny in New Orleans. And when Johnny asks if Santos is involved, she denies it. But bad plan. But they're, apparently they're going to like they were going to go up to the room and they're apparently going to have sex. But Johnny has to stop by his room, and when he goes to his room, he gets he gets basically uh, kidnapped by the hit squad. Yeah, because yes, Santos is involved. Yeah, and they and, take him uh, and they torture the crap out of him and do like mm-hmm. freaky get kind of get off on it a little bit between Joanna stu- and stuck stuck in the middle with you kind of stuff. Yeah, with, pretty uh, much. Yeah, yeah, it, it does get and a little bit know, of Reservoir Dogs. Yes, mm-hmm. and. I gotta say, Charles. Yeah. I think in real life, Diane Ladd and Harry Dean Stanton would have made an adorable couple. Right. <laughs> I'm totally I totally. Mean, I am told about I'm totally, the two of them that I think is just adorable. They make together. a cute couple. I agree. They make a cute couple. Yes, they do. Yeah. I mean, if it wasn't for Diane Ladd being batshit crazy, you know, uh, mm-hmm. at least in this movie. Yeah, he'd be. You know, he'd be a much better. I don't know how you know, she is in real life, but yeah. She's, uh, Diane Ladd is a very, um, I'm just teasing, very I'm just teasing by the way. No, no, th- you, you bring something up that's interesting. Yeah. Diane Ladd, uh, was on the TV show, the Celebrity Ghost Stories. Right. So she says she was haunted by the ghost of Martha Mitchell after Martha Mitchell passed away. Really? Yeah. Martha, Martha Mitchell, who was, the wife of John Mitchell, part of the Watergate. Oh, uh, right. Um, she was very outspoken about how much she did not approve of the government and what they were doing and stuff like that. So she was like kidnapped. Right. And kept against her will to get her to shut up. And, uh, 
you know, Diane Ladd found out about this and was appalled. And she says that uh, Martha, Martha Mitchell like came to her in a dream and asked her to, you know, help tell her story. Interesting. So, Diane Ladd's had some interesting stuff going on. Yeah, seriously, right? That's interesting. So, um, so on the way, on the trying to go out to California. They end up, you know, this is where they come across the car accident. They're driving at night. And Lynch does his trademark driving at night headlights on the road. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the David Lynch headlights on the road, yeah. one of my favorites. Ever. Yeah, one of his favorite uh, go-tos mm-hmm. as far as imagery. And so, this, yeah, this is where we they, they, they see the wreck. They pull over and they, they check out to see what's happened. And then all of a sudden... Sherilyn Finn comes stumbling out off off screen into the into a shot and she's all like bloody and kind of just rambling a little bit kind of like me right now and no much 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 worse <laughs> yeah yeah but but apparently you know like Sula Lula says you know she's dying right in front of us it's she's very tragic right. very tragic she does die right in front of them it's it's horrible yeah and Sherilyn Finn oh my gosh Show and Ben does. I cannot say enough how wonderful of a performance she gives in this. Right. She's so perfect. She's so so tragic. Just she rips she rips your heart out through your nostrils. Yeah. It's very impressive. And obviously, David Lynch got to know her from do the Twin Peaks pilot, so he probably thought yeah. she would be great for this scene. And sure oh, yeah. enough, she was. So she dies right there. Sailor says, "Okay, well, we can't really do anything. Let's just go." So they get back in the car and it's kind of, it's almost kind of a loss of innocence moment because up until this point. They've just been having a good time. Yeah. Lula has essentially been this kind of, you know, very Marilyn Monroe-esque innocence. And what Lula is like just now 18, yeah. just now 19, yeah. something like that. Yeah. yeah. So, but, you know, she's, she's constantly, as she puts it, hotter than Georgia asphalt. Hotter than Georgia. I love, I love that quote. Yeah. yeah. Um. And this up until now, they've just been going in and out of hotels, right? Sex, glad to see each other, yeah. Listening to their favorite band, you know, it's not. It's She's been, a, they don't. She was the type that get would, would get upset because the car radio had news on that she didn't like. Yeah. And you know, yeah, there's this it. moment. Yeah, she's like, she gets out of the car and she's like, "Sailor, sailor, you get the you know, some music on that radio right now, or I will just lose my mind." Lose my mind. Yeah. Yeah. So she. And I don't think, I, I think. So this is a big moment for her. It's a, it's a big moment for her. And I think that Sailor knows that. It's like a code Marietta of reality. Gonna, yes. Sailor knows that Marietta is going to cause problems. Mm-hmm. But, and I think they both know that, but I think Sailor knows that there might be more problems than Lula knows there's going to be. Right. Like Lula knows, oh yeah, my mom's probably sending Johnny after us, blah, 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 blah. But Sailor probably knows, like, yeah, if Johnny's coming, then probably Santos isn't far behind. Like, yeah. I think Sailor knows more about there's imminent danger than, than Lula realizes. So Lula's just sort of happily on a road trip with her boyfriend, hoping her mom doesn't find out. You know, and even if her mom did find out, what's the worst that could happen? She's, she's like, like Johnny says, she's of age. She went with him willingly. There's nothing that can happen. Legally. Anyway. But then, yeah. Legally. Yeah, legally. Um, but then this accident happens where she watches someone die right in front of her and it just, it, and then, you know, it gets, it it's gets not her to stop after, and think a little bit. And it's not soon after that, that she's in the hotel room by herself and throws up because she's pregnant. Yeah. So things, then, are, and, things are starting to get real in the life of, of Lula. Right. And I like the fact that, well, she barfed as she puts it, but she doesn't clean it up. She just lets it also, lay there. And there's like flies like on it. And so, of course, David it's Lynch so is like, gross. so David Lynch is all over that with a camera. It's so disgusting. Yeah. I also like how she says she tried to make it to the bathroom, but it was the wrong door. <laughs> right. <laughs> Even where she tried to get to was still the wrong door. But, so. uh, but, but I'm like, you left it there? You didn't try to clean it up later? Clean uh, it up. Yeah. Right. It's like somebody could at least but step like, in that. And I just remember the first time I ever saw this movie. Yeah. And I was probably 16. The first time I saw this. Right. 
that I saw her say, I barfed. I'm like, oh, Lula's pregnant. Yeah. <laughs> like, right. I knew. It, I knew right that at that moment that Lula's now pregnant. Well, we couldn't get like a hundred sex scenes and then her not be pregnant at some point, right? You also can't have a tragic love story that doesn't have some sort of, you know. Yeah. This is nothing, this is nothing against parenthood, nothing against kids, but when you yeah. have these people that are trying to, someone's trying to murder one of them. Right. A baby is not what you need right now. <laughs> no, no, no. That's a, it's, it's another complication on an already complex world. So, yes. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, so they're in this little, like, Hickburg of Big Tuna, Texas. And this is where they meet, you know, um, as opposed to uh, where this is where, I think, um, this is where Sailor meets Perdita, I guess. And they've got, um, but this is where they meet Bobby Peru and Double O Spool and all the other sleezoids in this town. Seriously, it's like going into the and, apartment. It's 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 like going into Ben's apartment in yeah. Blue Velvet. All of these disgusting people. Yeah, so this is just really disturbing motel slash trailer park. I don't know what it is. It's but, not um, the fat trout. That's for damn sure. Right. But apparently Bobby has, you know, sees some potential with Sailor. More so after he goes and talks to Lula. Alone. Well, talks. In, alone, alone. Talks yeah, to was, Lula. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, well, he starts talking to her. He basically, he gets his way inside by saying, hey, do you mind if I use your toilet? I gotta, I gotta hit the head. I think. Yeah, yeah, or something, or something like that. Yeah. I'm not gonna like piss in your hair. I need right. to piss in your toilet. Yeah, exactly. Um, and he. He's I, obviously I like very that, disgusting about it when he does it. I I feel like that that scene where they, their their robbery scene, their armed yeah, robbery scene. Yeah. Right. Reminds me so much of the Hayseed Bank robbery scene in Raising Arizona. Yes, it does. Where you just have these two idiots yeah. who come and try and rob this nowheresville place. Yeah. Because they heard money was there. Don't forget the huggies. <laughs> Whatever cash you got. <laughs> no, just no, not not him robbing the convenience store. Oh. Um William Forsyth and John Goodman robbing the Hayseed Bank. Okay. Where they get the where they where they leave him behind and then yeah. they get the money. Okay. Die pack in it. It's been a while yeah. since I've seen that movie. Yeah, <laughs> we're using code names. That part. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny, but yeah, it's very reminiscent. You know, with the stocking, you know, the 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 pantyhose yeah. masks. Yeah, exactly. Son, you got a panty on your head. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Which aren't really that great of a mask. I'm just putting it out there. Yeah, they, they really, they really, really aren't. I no, think they, but they just have. Seen... They just look like you have your face pressed up against a window. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And now that I've seen Nicolas Cage that way twice, I could probably that'd be how I recognize Nicolas Cage the most if I saw him on the street. Yeah. So like, oh, pantyhose. That's Nick Cage. That's <laughs> Nicolas Cage. Yeah. So God, God forbid, Nicolas Cage in real life robs a bank. He better not be wearing pantyhose because everybody's going to still recognize him. Seriously, everybody's going to know that that's him. He's he needs to wear just a like a B cage over. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. So. <laughs> Who, by the way, right. we need to mention, uh, was married to Patricia Arquette from Lost Highway. Oh. Yeah. Nice connection. They were married. Yeah, they were married for a while. Yeah. I figured I'd just mention a little bit of David Lynch romance trivia. Yeah. So, um, so before, before the robbery what goes, you know, sideways, um, Bobby had confronted Lula in the, in the room. And this is where we get that really creepy scene of him essentially trying to get her to say that she would F him. So essentially oh, it's, this, it's this whole creepy intimidation thing. Can we talk to for a minute about Willem Dafoe's dental prosthetic for this movie? Yes, we should, because it is a thing. <laughs> yes, we need to talk about that. It's like, so, so it makes Willem Dafoe, who... Let's face it, it's not exactly the most handsomest guy in the world anyway. I mean, he can be. Depending but... on the lighting, maybe, but and the, and the he... suit he's wearing, perhaps. Yeah, but he can he can go from zero to creepy in right. like right. eight seconds. Yeah, I mean, he, it's just much. His body has physical range. Let's just put it that way. That's an excellent, excellent diplomatic way of saying that. Yes, yes. 
But well, I'm to as, as someone who also has broad physical range, yes, I can I can say that. See, you're like a you're like a nice guy. You're a nice looking guy. You got like this Mel Gibson thing going on before we knew he was racist. I was gonna say I hope I didn't like I hope it's that after he was admittedly racist. No, no, seriously. You get if you grew out a mullet, you'd be Mad Max. You know, you're, I did. You're a, I did have a mullet in the '90s. So oh, I need photos of that, and I would now. <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> But yeah, no, there you're you you're like a classically good looking guy with a nice yeah. smile and you've got you know, it looks like you brush your teeth occasionally. Uh yeah, every day. Go figure. <laughs> on a daily basis. Yeah, on a daily so basis. Not... I'm kinda I, weird I, I'm kinda I, weird like that, but yeah. I would think that it would take a lot for you to be creepy. Like I'd have to really make you up to make you look creepy. <laughs> okay. Whereas Willem Willem Defoe, you just put him in a leather jacket and yeah. shave his head at, like he is in Grand Budapest Hotel and already he's a murderer. Right. Like I think you need a little more work to be as creepy as he is. But yeah. Willem Dafoe... But here, they, he, basically, they give him this ridiculously gummy grin. With it's the gummy, but the, teeth the... Are, but the teeth are also kind of rotten. Yeah. And it makes him... Because, like I said, Willem Dafoe is one of those guys that's, like, so ugly, he's kind of cute. Yeah. In, like, an ugly dog kind of way, like a Steve Buscemi. Right. Like, Buscemi, like a Buscemi, Buscemi, is a gr- Buscemi is a great example. Like he's not he's not like a good looking guy, but he's not a bad looking guy. But if he wants to go creepy, it doesn't take much. No, it doesn't. And and essentially, you, he kind of looks like he has an orange peel in his mouth, like in Godfather. Kind of, yeah. If you remember the dental appliance that Matt Dillon wears in "There's Something About Mary," okay. Put that in a fish tank for six months. <laughs> that's what Willem Dafoe is. And don't wearing. clean the fish tank. And don't clean it. No, don't put any of those tablets yeah. in it. Don't clean the teeth. Yes. Just pull it out of the fish tank, throw it in Willem Dafoe's mouth, and throw him on yeah. the screen. Just like That's Gil what... said, don't clean the tank. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Don't clean the tank. Yeah. So, so right there, that's a double Willem Dafoe reference for those paying attention. See, you can't you can't get enough of him. No, exactly. He's everywhere. You can't escape him. So, so there that was there was that scene. So when the when um, Bobby gets, you know, they go to do the robbery at the feed store and Bobby essentially d- gets really into it, kills the guards and Sailor's like, what the hell are you doing? Bobby is just way too into, he, right. he's in it for the murder. Like even if he right. was robbing a bank, he's a he psych- would not be in it. He's, he's literally psychotic. Yes. He's not in it for the money. He's in, he's in it to shoot people. Yeah, exactly. So. And essentially, he also double crosses Sailor in the process. So this might have been part of his plan because he gives Sailor uh, an unloaded gun. It was filled with blanks or something. And so Sailor can't do anything about it. The cops show up while Perdita is outside in the in the caddy or whatever, the the convertible waiting. So she's yeah. essentially the yeah. lookout. Mm-hmm. And the cops show up. She's talking. She's talking to a cop, and, right. and she hears a shot, and, then, and she's like, I'm out. See ya. Yeah, she, she's like, yeah. She's like, peace out, peels right out. And the cop, you know, at this moment, you know, this is when Sailor comes through first. And, you know, the, the cop, you know, says, all right, get down to the ground. Get down to the ground. And then all of a sudden, um, Bobby comes out. And then this is where he trips. And, the, you know, as he's trying to stumble his way out the door, and the gun, he drops the gun, and the gun blows his head off gross but you're sort of like oh thank god <laughs> yes yeah <laughs> this world is so much better without bobby peru in it oh my god <laughs> pretty much but but obviously the damage has already been done sailors busted once again because of really bad decisions exactly sailor this time sailor goes to jail for five years in 10 months <laughs> yeah in 10 months yes yeah but then he gets released once again and this time he doesn't have any parole obligations for whatever reason. No, he's just he's served his time. Yeah, I mean, I think he, I think he probably was sentenced to five years and he got five years. So he did the full term essentially. He did his full term, and so he did probably know, get now, parole. See, yeah, right. He just he just did his time, and he's and he's released. And so, go ahead and stamp your form, Sonny, and stop wasting my time. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, the. One prophylactic used. Used. Soiled. Soiled. That's what it is. Soiled. soiled. Yeah. I forgot. Soiled. That's the adjective. Yeah. Soiled. Yeah. Recidivism. 
That's a bonehead word, but that ain't me no more. Okay, so now that I'm done with all of my prison, getting out of prison references. Right. He gets out of prison, and we can, if we thought Marietta was crazy waiting 22 months for Sailor to get out of jail. Right. Five years of waiting for Sailor to get out of jail. She has lost her damn right. mind. Right. And Lula has sort of. Now, this is obviously after the fact that she had taken lipstick. A stick of, you know, and rubbed it around on her wrist, and you thought, okay, that's a little odd. And then it then just it goes all over her hands, that, all over her that's, face. That suddenly, everywhere. like, it's everywhere. So she has essentially, yeah. like, um, a, a completely red face, like you were saying, very devilish. Yeah. And Charles, I don't know if you ever did any theater in school, but if you've ever gotten lipstick on your face, not your lips, right? It does not come off easily. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I you... think she was probably tinted reddish for yeah. like a week <laughs> yeah, yeah probably <laughs> after doing that so so lula on the other hand is sort of she's she's grown up a lot she's a little bit more respectable she's being a she's being what i assume is a good mom to pace yeah we have no reason to think otherwise we have no reason to think otherwise and i would think that you know lula is a, you know deep down in her heart lula's a sweet girl right and i think she'd want pace to have a childhood like she had so she is going to go pick up Sailor at the train. And, because she's still in love with him after all these years. And she's and he's Pace's father. Pace needs Pace has never met his father. Right. So So they basically they she brings Pace along when she picks up Sailor. Right. And uh you know, go say hi to your your uh daddy Pace. Now, they, how they shake they, hands. They shake hands, and Sailor has a toy. Not say, yeah, Sailor has a toy farm. It's a little stuffed lion. Right, as in cowardly lion. Yes. How much did I wish that was a bunny? <laughs> I mean, yes, lion is in cowardly lion. Right. I get the Wizard of Oz reference, but yeah. hindsight being twenty twenty, I wish it would have been a bunny. That would have been freaking hilarious. <laughs> Either that, or the it's all about it's all about the bunnies. Either that or the makers of Con Air should no. It's not about. Is it about the bunnies? No, no, it's not about the bunnies. Is it the about the The makers of Con Air should have made it a lion instead yep. of a bunny, frankly. Right, right. So you know, although why couldn't you just put down the bunny? It's a fabulous, <laughs> stupid lion that everyone loves to say. Right. Oh, that movie's terrible. Speaking of mullets, please make the stage. Right. Well, you know that was his decade to shine. So yeah, let's just put it that way. Um, Talking about going off the rails so, too, man. So, you think okay, all oh, there, you know, the family's all together now. Everything's going to be hunky dory, right? Everything's going to be good. No, because Lulu starts to cry. Lulu starts to cry, and and you know she's a little upset. You know she's like, you know, like it's been obviously six years, so it's it's going to take a little adjusting. And after everything that happened, and. Sailor's like, okay, this isn't going to work. So I'm out of here. And you get the feeling that Lula has just sort of started to cry randomly thinking about Sailor over the right. last five years, probably. Right. Everything that like, happened. I don't think, I don't think this is the first time Pace has seen this happen. No. So Sailor essentially, you know, he says goodbye to Pace, gives him some like really lame, you know, advice for life. And then he walks off. Yeah, I don't think Sailor had a very good father figure in his life. Either. No, no, pretty much. No, he and Sailor was just like, look, he doesn't really know me. He hasn't known me. He's, he, this is our first meeting. He can't be that attached to me. He doesn't. He doesn't know me. He's not going to miss me if I go. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, so yeah, he he decides it's best if he leaves. So he leaves. Lulu is cr Lulu uh, Lula. Excuse me, is crushed. And when he's walking down. What appears to be like, you know, just a, a busy, what should have been normally a busy street. It's it like looks a, like an old west ghost town. <laughs> right, pretty much. Like, like where are the cars in this town? Because this looks kind of like a, a pretty, you know, w widely used street. It's like meanwhile in the Disney back lot. Yeah, pretty much. So, you know, essentially the extras from West Side Story crawl out of the woodwork and mm -hmm. start following him. And he basically, uh, yeah, lays down a, a some uh, homophobic uh, put downs, which they don't take too kindly of. No, they don't, because this was the '90s, and you know, being gay was an insult. Yeah, pretty much. Although, to be fair, at least uh, 
uh, Sailor apologized for calling them homosexuals. <laughs> I love that where he's on the ground. Right, exactly. I would like to apologize to you, gentlemen, for calling you, you homosexuals. Calling you homosexuals. <laughs> So great. The delivery on that is just cracks me up. He, in the Elvis and voice. So, in the Elvis in, voice. In his Nicholas in his Nicholas Cage yeah. Elvis voice. The Nick so Cage Elvis perfect. voice. It is, yeah, it's hilarious. So um I mean it's horrible what he did, but yeah, it's 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 pretty funny. So while he's lying there on the ground after they kick his ass, uh he gets a vision of Glinda the Good Witch. Although obviously for legal reasons she's not called Glinda in this movie. She's just the good witch. And the she's good witch. Laura Palmer. Yeah. There is a good witch and a bad witch. So she's Only the good bad witch. bad witches are ugly. Right. And she's a good witch. She's, she comes down in the bubble and right. has this outfit. And, 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 beautiful. and played to perfection by – you couldn't Lynch couldn't have found any better actress than Cheryl Lee for this. Cheryl Lee. Yep. Because she's got that, you know, that Laura Palmer great smile – you know, just that beautiful smile, that, that angel- angel- baby voice. Right, exactly. And just, you know, yep. suits that part to perfection as far as I'm concerned. And she basically tells Sailor, get your head out of your ass and go where you belong. Which- yeah, exactly. This is where we get, we get the don't turn away from love. And so he comes to apologize. Like I said, I apologize for calling you homosexuals. And he's like, Lula. Lula. And then runs yeah. off, runs off after her, and there's like a traffic jam there. So he doesn't just walk, you know, run between the cars. He runs on top of the cars over. He each runs on car. top. Of, yeah, it's 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 very everybody hurts moment where he just it's a traffic jam. And he yes. just runs on top of all the cars. That's, that's a great that's a great reference, by the way. Yes, I, <laughs> I haven't thought about that in like three thirty years. Yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So, and then they finally, you know, he finally reaches their car and then, you know, he, t- you know, it's all this big, you know, build up moment for the climax. And then he lifts her up and then starts singing Love Me Tender to her as the end credits roll. Oh. And you're like, what is this ending? This is not a David Lynch ending. It's so great. It's such a so sappy romantic ending. I love it. Love I love me it. tender. And that's love, all he to say to her. He's yep. already told her what that means. Right. We, the audience already know what that means. Right, right. And you know she's been waiting to hear that song ever since she found out. Yeah. That that's what that is. And that's just, it's, it, oh, boy. It's that definitely tug on the heartstrings moment. I'm trying to think. Is it the, it's not, I don't think it's the best Elvis Presley love song, but it's it's up there. It's no, up there. It is a, I don't, yeah, I wouldn't say it's the the best one. The best Elvis Presley love song is Can't Help Falling in Love. End of yes, story. <laughs> yes, I agree with that. That's what I was trying to think of. Yes, you're absolutely right. I mean, if you think I'm wrong, but right. I don't think Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can't help falling in love with you. Yeah. And, you know, anybody that covers that song does a great job. Yeah, like, right. You know, U2's cover of that is a fantastic cover. Right. So it, it's, even the even the cover yeah, Bono of that, really Bono really hits those falsetto notes with that one. Yeah. Oh, so great. Yeah. Um, but uh, you know, I like "Love Me" too. "Love Me" is a great song. "Love Me" is a great song. Yep. Yeah. But but, uh, but "Love Me Tender" is great. Perfect for this scene. It's perfect for the scene, and when he starts singing to her, you know, that's him asking him her to marry him. Yeah. And I know Nick Cage did this in a studio, but he did a really good job with it. I'm telling you, Charles, the reason to buy this soundtrack is yeah. Nicholas singing his Elvis song. Yeah. Buy an entire record of Nicholas Cage singing Elvis love song. Yeah, you can say what you want about Nicholas Cage as an actor, and I will totally agree with you 100% when no matter what is said, but he does a very good job singing Limby Tender here. He actually, does a good, he actually does a good job singing Love Me earlier in the film. When you're when somebody is going to imitate Elvis, it yeah. might as well be Nick Cage. Right. Job. He nails He's it. Great. He knows it. Totally. He, gets, he gets the spirit. He gets the tone. And he does it without being a cheesy impression. Do you hear me? No, it's, it's not a cheesy impression. It's it natural. A loving, yeah. It's a loving of Elvis. Do you remember the Saturday Night Live sketch? Um, Tiny Elvis? Yeah, at the Dimly Do, yeah. 
where Nicolas Cage is Elvis, but he's only like eight inches tall. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that was that was a while back too. Boy, well, I'm going down memory lane tonight. This is a this is this is good. Yeah. Yeah. So that's essentially the movie, everybody. Do you have a rating for this? Rating for this movie? It's, I guess it's pretty high, right? Yeah, this is it. Oh, and we, we also need to, I, I also need to remind everybody, and this is a little strange. Okay. After he divorced Patricia Arquette, Nicolas Cage married Lisa Marie Presley. Right. I forgot about that. I think I blocked that out of my memory. You're right. Which I Which don't... is the ultimate Elvis fanboy move. The ultimate Elvis fanboy move, but I don't know if I'd want to be with somebody that imitates my dad that well, but that's just me. Yeah. I mean, it's not like he probably does it all the time. No, probably not, but it'd be like... I would hope not. Like, imagine you're just sitting at home flipping through cable while the heart is on. You're like, oh, hey, look, it's my brownie. Oh, God. Oh, God. No. No, no, I don't want to do this. Yeah, it is kind of the ultimate... Fanboy move. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, it's, it's kind of like David Tennant marrying Georgia Moffat, the daughter of Peter Davison. A little bit, a little, a little bit. Yeah, it's that kind of like ultimate fanboy move, but also kind of creepy on the side. Yes, it's, you know, it's like okay, so my dad's the doctor. Why don't right. I just marry a doctor? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and oh, like, oh, by the way, you know, she played the doctor's daughter, so it's even worse because yeah. essentially, yeah. she's you know, her husband is her father, quote unquote. And her father... And her father is her father. (laughs) Yeah, her father... Yeah, it's very... It's like this weird, geeky time travel version of, like, some debutante girl whose dad is a physician who then has to marry a physician. Yeah. It's like... Well, my father was doctor. My father was doctor, who I should also marry doctor. (laughs) It's it's kind of like the Futurama Futurama episode where Fry has sex with his grandmother. It becomes his own grandfather. He did do the nasty and the pasty. Right. <laughs> but yeah, I was I was thinking about her the other day when, when I was watching Doctor Who. Yeah. And I was thinking like, wow, yeah, she just has never known life that doesn't have Doctor Who in her house. Like, no. Nope. <laughs> kind of like me. No, just kidding. Well, well, there, you know. there were those first 14 years when I before I started watching Doctor Who. But yeah. But it's not like it's not like your mom was Leela one and you married Leela two. No, you know? no, no, <laughs> no, no. That's all I'm saying. Yes. No, <laughs> not anywhere near that. No, no. Yeah, no. My, I think my rating for this one's probably. Uh, let's see. What should I? What should I give this a rating? Of um, this is a. Uh, Eight out of ten lost hairbrushes. Okay. Yeah. All right. And I just mostly because I, I like this love story for you know so help me. Right. I like this love story. Um, I love Laura Dern. And everybody and I and I love Diane Ladd in this movie. I absolutely I mean Diane Ladd is batshit crazy right. in this movie, but I love her. Okay. Yeah. Now, I, I don't feel as strongly about this one as you do, mm-hmm. but I don't hate it either. I just, there, it's not, you know, as far as the David Lynch films, it's, it's no blue velvet. It's no blue velvet. No. Or Mulholland drive. So I'm mm-hmm. going to give this one seven out of 10 yeah. photos melted with ice cubes. Oh, that's a good one. I'm melting. I'm melting. Obviously, another direct oh, Ver- Wizard of Oz homage. Yeah, you draw, you draw, you throw your drink in a picture of your mom. Yeah, she's a witch. Yeah, yeah. she's just I mean, a witch. If she weighs the same as a duck, she's made of wood, and therefore a witch. Who are you that's so wise in the ways of science, Charlie? <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Um, so it was either that or I was going to go with nibbled candy necklaces, if you had taken that one. Oh, the nibbled candy necklace. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Because yeah. Sailor gives Lula a candy necklace, and he's mm-hmm. like, don't eat it. You know, save it for when you, you know, if you really need to, you can eat it later. But, yeah. and, then, and then, you know, when Sailor gets busted that second time. That's when she eats that's it. That's when she eats it. Yeah. Yeah. Candy necklaces, by the way, are delicious. Right. And they're not just for children. They're delicious. Okay. I don't think I've ever eaten a candy necklace. 
Oh my god! I've Charles, seen them. So I've good. seen them, but I haven't eaten one. They're, do you like Smarties? Yeah, or sweet tarts. Yeah. They're essentially Smarties. Yeah. 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 I get it. I get the premise. I mean, I've had Smarties, but I just never had them on a necklace before. Oh well, you need to just you know just wear one, just eat it whenever yeah. you feel like it, yeah. and then all of a sudden, all you have is a disgusting, half wet, half sugary <laughs> sticking piece of sticking to your neck. neck. And you've never been so sad. <laughs> nice. All right. So we didn't get a ghost wood mail this time, sadly, again. So, guys, we want to hear from you. Write in. Uh, I know. I know. We're listening. We, yeah, the yeah. I've seen the downloads. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, you know. I Poland. I know you're listening to us, Poland. Right. Or shout out to every Sweden or all the other countries that. All think, over the world. Yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, the global phenomenon Twin that is ghost wood, the Twin Peaks podcast. Yeah. You know, let us know. Tell me, what is your favorite Elvis love song? Right. Or, you know, your David, favorite David Lynch movie. We've been talking David Lynch movies. Or but... I'll get Charles to post a picture of himself with a mullet. You know, write <laughs> about that. You can try. <laughs> <laughs> hey, if I posted that stupid picture of me well, with, that... uh, Harriet, with Harriet's hair, yeah. you can post a mullet photo. Well, that was your mistake, not mine. <laughs> Oh, come on, Charles. Quid pro quo, Clarice. <laughs> nice. Okay. I see how it is. I see how it is. All right. So uh, so please write to us at Ghostwood Podcast at – all right, Nez, what are you crinkling now? I'm trying to do the mail. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just – I had to – I had to – something was on the couch in the cat's way. I had to pick it up. Okay. All right. I'm just teasing you. All right. So – Ghostwoodpodcast at gmail.com. That's ghostwoodpodcast at the gmail.com. Would love to hear from you. The Gmail. Or you can find us on Twitter at ghostwoodcast on Twitter. Or Ghostwood Twin Peaks Podcast on the Facebooks. So like and follow us there. Tell your friends about us. Um, share us. You know, we definitely would obviously love to keep growing the podcast. You know, we thank you to everyone who does already. But uh, obviously we like more, you know, because we're greedy like that. Mm -hmm. So let people know. And if you get the chance and if if you enjoy what we do, also, hey, please go to Apple Podcasts and rate and review us. Yeah, let us, you know. That helps people find us, believe it or not, because they're they're crazy algorithm thing. Exactly. And and we just mostly want to know other Twin Peaks nerds or other David Lynch nerds just like us. Exactly. And if you follow us on, like, you know, Twitter or Facebook, we'll follow you back because we're cool like that. All right. So, Zane, where can they reach you? Uh, Twitter and Instagram is Udenax19. Facebook is Zan Sprouse. And if you, you know, want to hear me get off subject even more, <laughs> you can listen to you and me on Drunk Cinema. And if they want to hear me try and sound like I know something about what I'm talking about, about movies, you can listen to me. DJ Which is always. On Gold Standard, the Twin Peaks Podcast. Or not, not Gold Standard, the Twin Peaks Podcast. Gold Standard, the Oscars Podcast. This is Ghostwood. The Twin Peaks podcast. Too many G's in my podcast. Yeah, are you sure? Yeah. Although, you know, I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna talk to Nick, and we're gonna see if we can get him to change that to Gold Standard, the Twin Peaks podcast. Well, if you ask me, Ghostwood is the gold standard of Twin Peaks. Oh, podcast. nice. See. Okay, that, 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 that deserves this. I'm thinking that. Thank you. Well played. Well played. Thank you very much. All right. So, everybody, if you want to hear me or find me on the Internet, check me out at Charles Skaggs on Instagram, at Charles Skaggs on Twitter, or Facebook, Charles Skaggs in Hilliard, Ohio, or my blog of geeky things. Wait for it. Damn good coffee and hot. Damn good coffee and hot. We're talking about all the stuff we talk about here on Ghostwood, including, hey, Twin Peaks stuff, David Lynch stuff. Comic book sci-fi news. I just posted the first seven actors that have been revealed for Neil Gaiman's The Sandman. That's going to be on Netflix. Oh, yeah. I saw that post. Yeah, including the casting of Dream, which I had originally reported back in September because yours truly knows the score. And they confirmed it today, officially. So so just putting that out there. So you want to check me out on that. Uh, Also, news of my other podcasts for Southgate Media, including the aforementioned... What drunk cinema that I do with Zan, where we just finished talking the adventures of Buckaroo Banzai across the eighth dimension. Had a great time with that. Zan took a little bit of a spill, but uh, she she survived it. 
and she's uh, you know, she's still here with us, thankfully. And then coming up next on our, our fifth episode, we're going to be discussing, which has now become a tribute, sadly. We're going to be discussing Young Frankenstein, a.k.a. Young Frankenstein, in tribute, of course, now to the late the Cloris Leachman. The late great Cloris Leachman, As yes. Frau Blucher. <laughs> Blucher. No. <laughs> I just love Marty Feldman when he does it. You know, he's just all like, oh, Bucher. yeah. Bucher. And then yeah. he just, he, he smiles. He's so proud of yeah, himself. Yeah, he's just he's like, like, yeah, he's so smug. Yeah. So, yeah, we're going to be, you know, obviously talking about her her passing, sadly. But we're going to have a lot of fun talking Young Frankenstein. Because, like Zan yeah. said, this is like one of the top two all-time comedy classics. D- depending on the day you ask me, yeah. I will tell you that the greatest American comedy film Right, is either this or airplane? Okay, I was wondering what the other one was. I was I was yeah. considering airplane, but it depends on the day you ask me. Right, what I say. That's yeah. fair. That's fair. Just depending on your mood. Okay. So, mm-hmm. uh, in addition to drunk cinema, there's next stop everywhere the Doctor Who podcast where Zan just joined us this past week to talk sure resur- resurrection of the Daleks, and we had a good time with that. And she's certainly welcome to come back, and we've got her on the schedule already to come back. So. Stay oh, tuned gonna. for that. But uh, coming up on that, we're going to be talking for the next four episodes. We're going to be discussing Trial of a Time Lord, the final four stories of Colin Baker's era. Yep. And we've got Rachel Friend from Zan, you know, one of Zan's partners on Gold Standard, the Oscars podcast. Not, sort of yes. Twin Peaks podcast. It's sadly never going to be a sort of Twin Peaks podcast because we're <laughs> never, ever, ever going to talk about a best picture that was directed by David Lynch. We're well, going to talk about a couple. We can, of, we can always uh, do. Uh, can we do uh, Fire Walk with Me as a Patreon thing? Yeah, sure. You want to donate, Charles? <laughs> Maybe I will. Maybe you should. Maybe. Um, yeah. David Lynch has directed two movies that have been up for best picture, and neither one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, go figure. But he did get, you know, that honorary Oscar. He did. Thank you very much. Yeah, because uh, he needed it. He deserved it. And, and then there's also, hey, the Phantom Zone podcast where DJ Nick, Jesse Jackson, and I, we talk, we're talk. we talking WandaVision right now, which I'm trying to get Zan to watch because it has, especially after episode three, serious Twilight Zone overtones. That might sell me. Yeah. yeah, I would definitely recommend it. There's a there's definitely a Bill Moomy Twilight Zone episode thing going on here, and probably going to get even more weirder in that. Mm-hmm. One. Yeah, That's interesting. Zan's giving me homework to read after this podcast, so I've got a whole list of things I got to check out. I'm, just, here. I'm putting things in the chat, so yeah, I appreciate that. And then, last but certainly not least, Titan Talk, the Titans podcast, where obviously we talk Titans and, and Doom Patrol, but they're on hiatus right now, but. They'll be coming, hopefully, to HBO Max later this year for season three on both shows. And we're already getting some casting news. They cast Batgirl, or excuse me, Barbara Gordon, and they just recently cast Tim Drake for oh, Titan yeah? season three. Yeah, they just revealed that today. So we may have some news to talk about here shortly. As uh, yeah, Let's talk about share. Remind everybody that we're still out there. So check that out as well. I definitely appreciate it. And then come on back for episode 92. The big question, though. What are we going to talk about next time on Ghostwood? Lost Highway. I was going to ask you if it, you know if we're going to do more movies that leaves like two right. There's Lost Highway and Inland Empire. And unfortunately, we can't do Inland Empire. Right, because it hasn't been released. Yeah, it hasn't been released. Yeah. Charles likes to remind everybody that I fell asleep in it at three in the morning. I didn't even say it this cat time. Cat. You brought it up. Well, I figured you were close. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, if it bothers you that much, I won't do it again. It was three in the morning and I don't drink caffeine. So, you know. Yeah. Okay. I just would like to remind everyone I was not the guy snoring in the theater. Yeah. Well, I that just w- dozed off for about 15 minutes. Well, I would like to remind everybody I was not that guy either. No, you didn't fall asleep at all. No, I didn't. I was, I exactly. stayed awake. And surprisingly, I stayed awake for the whole thing, even after having a it's beer. A fantastic. To, even after having a beer to relax me. It's a fantastic movie. It just was late at night. <laughs> It was really late. <laughs> I think it was just adrenaline because I'd never seen this movie before. That's what kept me up. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. I wanted to find out what happened. And you still never did. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, because it's David Lynch. It's, but yeah. It's one of the least linear David Lynch movies I've ever seen. Yes. So yeah. Let's let's talk some Beretta. 
Yeah, let's talk Lost uh, Highway. Let's talk Lost Highway. So we got Bill Pullman and let's see who else is in this movie. Oh, Patricia Arquette. Patricia Arquette. Uh, what a Robert Loggia. Yeah, the the infamous Robert Loggia scene that they love so much. The greatest scene, the the greatest scene of Robert Loggia on film in the history of Robert Loggia. I'll probably um, I'll probably predict that we will spend at least a half an hour dissecting that entire sequence. Oh, and I'm going to recite the entire thing too. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Because I know you're a big, huge fan of that. The infamous Robert Blake right. is in this. In this is the best thing he ever did. Um, we've got uh, Gary Busey, Baltazar Getty, right? Um, we uh, got Natasha Red, Gregson yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So we got yeah, we got a lot of people in this one. Yeah, so this should be a lot to talk about. And Richard Pryor, Richard Pryor. Oh, that's right. Movie. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm gonna have fun watching that again. All right, because that one I do have on my DVR, so I got that available. Yeah, so that's a good one. So the, as we kind of bring our David Lynch film series to a close, at long last, mm-hmm. at least until Criterion releases some of these on whenever that happens, and we can discuss extra features. Yeah, right, exactly. All right. Yep. So everybody, thank you so much for listening. And then come on back next time, like like we were just talking about, episode 92, we're going to talk Lost Highway. So break out the Hank Williams, because that's where the title comes from, Lost Highway. So the title comes from, but you need to break out the David Bowie for this one. Well, there's that too, yeah. Yeah. So it should be a pretty solid discussion once again, and we'll see you next time right here, Ghost with the Twin Peaks Podcast. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye, everybody.